You know, <clears throat> this morning, a little bit earlier, we had sunrise service. And um, uh, I remember when I, when I left the house early, before, the, before, before it even got light to come to the church, I was looking, I could see the moon. I thought, man, the clouds are, are moving back, and I could see the moon. That means we're going to have a beautiful sunrise service. And, of course, it was a beautiful sunrise service, but the clouds held back uh, the sun, and we couldn't see the sun. We could see it was getting light, but we didn't have that bright sunshine. And, and I was, I was kind of thinking about it. I was a little disappointed at first, and then, you know, uh, then I was reminded that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, ascended on a cloud. And when he comes back, He's coming back in the cloud. What a praise this morning. Because if it weren't for the clouds, there'd be no chance for Jesus to come back. So, while we didn't get to see the sunshine, we did get to see the clouds. And he uses those as well. So this morning, as uh, we begin our time together, um, I, I, want you to, I want you to look at, at, at the windows for just a few minutes and, pay it, and just kind of look. Just look all around at the, at the stained glass windows and the beauty of the light that shines through those windows. So a while back, a while back, uh, I, I, I think it was on a Thursday morning. Uh, by the way, on Thursday mornings at 7.30, we're probably going to change that to 8 o'clock uh, here in a little bit. But at 7.30, uh, we meet, uh, men, we meet here, men, at 7.30 on Thursday mornings. And, and, we, and we, come, we get right here uh, at this altar and we pray together. We, we uh, lift up uh, our families, we lift up each other, we lift up the church, we lift up the ministries of the church and the community, whatever God kind of puts on our hearts. And we, and we get right down here on our knees and, and, and we pray about that. And, one, and, and, and the great thing about that, because we come at 7, we were coming at 7, we, we went to 8 o'clock and we moved back to 7.30 just because to try to accommodate some schedules and things. But... If you've ever had the opportunity to come into the sanctuary early in the morning while it's still dark, and man, you're down here on your knees and you're praying, and, and we don't pray as a group, but we just kind of go around and however long it takes is how long it takes. Every, everybody gets to pray. So if you haven't been invited, I want to invite you to come and be part of that Thursday morning. We have a great time uh, on Thursday mornings to do that. Uh, and, and, and this, um, you know, I, I was thinking about how to, how to say that invitation. Uh, I was going to say it's not an exclusive group, but, but it is. It's an exclusive group of men that come and pray. Now, you, you could say, uh, well, why am I exclusive? You're not. It's exclusive only in the fact that God knows who's going to show up here on Thursday mornings. That's the only exclusion. That there is, okay? So if you haven't been invited, you've been invited. We'd love to have you come on Thursday morning. But what I, what I, what I was going to say, if you, you, we get here on Thursday mornings and it's early and it's still, it's still not light outside. It's, 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 it's kind of dark and, and you're here on your knees and you're praying and, and we finish our prayer time. By the time we, we get all the way around and you look up and the light is coming through these beautiful these beautiful stained glass windows. And if you've ever stopped and, and, and just took time to walk around, I, I did this a while back. I, 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 w I, was, I was here in the sanctuary and I was, I was standing right here and, and I, I started and I was looking around and if you, if you follow the windows around the church, they, they tell the story of Jesus. Uh, and, and it starts from the beginning, from his he, 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 the angel coming to tell that he was coming all the way around, all the way around to his ascension. And uh, I kind of got to notice it, though, because after I thought about it, I came back in here and I, I was standing here one morning and I looked and I was standing here and I started here and I looked all the way around. I walked all the way around the whole church and I looked at each window and I came back and I stood right here in this spot. And I realized that it brought me back to the cross. The cross. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our faith. 
It is the chosen symbol of the Christian faith. These glass windows, they tell the story of Jesus Christ. The cross is the story of Jesus Christ. Thank God we see an empty cross this morning. An empty cross. But, but what does that cross mean to us? What, what does the cross mean to us? Is, is the cross, uh, 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 is, it, is, it, is it just a, a nicely sculptured piece of, of wood uh, uh, sanded down and made smooth so that we don't get any splinters from it and it feels good in our, in our hands or it looks pretty setting on a, on a little table to the side? Or, or maybe is it a beautiful piece of decoration that's made on a chain and we, we wear it around our neck? What is it? What is it to us? Jesus went to the cross so that we, through His death and resurrection, might have a personal relationship with God and that we might know its power in every area of our lives. You know, so often in our lives, we, we, we do, we like to kind of, we like to have our own little spaces and our own little places and and, and we like to kind of compartmentalize things. And, and, and you know, there's just places, there's places in our lives where we're just not comfortable allowing Christ to be. And He asked us to allow Him full access, complete access to every part of our lives. But, <clears throat> but oftentimes, we, we only let Him just have parts of it. Jesus went to the cross so that we might know the power of the cross. The cross is Jesus stretched out. It's Jesus stretched out between heaven and earth, suffering more than anyone can ever imagine, That more than anyone has ever suffered for you and for me. The cross is Jesus, our Savior. The cross is the place where heaven's love and heaven's justice meets. There'll be a day. There will be a day. God loves us, but there'll be a day where we'll stand before Him. And, and, and we'll, have to, we'll, have to, we'll have to be responsible for those things that we omitted to do and for those things that we did do that we shouldn't have done. The Gospel contains the most wonderful commentary on the cross in the words of Jesus Himself, spoken from the cross itself. There are seven sayings that are recorded. If there are more than that, uh, we, don't know, we don't know that that, but I think it's significant that it's seven because seven is God's perfect number. It represents completeness and wholeness. As Jesus hung on the cross some 2,000 years ago, He made seven statements. The first word or the first statement that He made comes from the Gospel of Luke. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, if you'll turn, find your way to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, and let's look at verse 34 together. Luke 23 and verse 34. When you find it and you begin to see the words, I know that it'll be a very uh, familiar statement. Luke chapter 23 and verse 34 says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgive them, Jesus said. Forgive them. Who? Who, I wonder? Who was, who was Jesus talking to? Who was He speaking of when He said, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That, there were so many groups of people that were gathered around the cross that day. There were the soldiers from the Roman garrison that were gathered around the cross that day. There were, there were the teachers who hated Him and the priests who bought Him with silver. There were the traitors who, who bought Him with silver. There were the teachers who hated Him. There were the traitors who sold Him, to, who sold, sold him out. And there was that crowd who cried, Crucify Him, crucify Him at the trial. And in the distance there was Pilate. How about Pilate? Pilate had an opportunity to, to just push the whole thing aside, but he didn't. And then there was the disciples. 
That was the disciples. Some were present and some were hiding in fear that the next cross might be their cross. So who, who, who I wonder was Jesus referring to? Father, forgive them. The second verse or the second phrase also comes from Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. It says, Today you will be with me in paradise. God not only sees the whole world, but He sees it made up of individuals. He sees it as you and me. Lord, remember me. You see, there's salvation. There's salvation in the cross. And then there's a third verse. And it comes from the Gospel of John. It's chapter 19. It's verses 26 and 27. And Jesus said to his mother, Dear woman, here's your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. This word tells us that there's love. For you in the cross. And it is a love which having been received is to be shared with others. It's a wonderful love. It's a different kind of love than the world has ever known. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of, the, of the, uh, the sculpture sometimes that you see. And there's one that, that uh, I, I love those little water sculptures, right? And have you ever seen the one, it's, it's got like a series of, of buckets, and then it falls back down into the pool, and, and there's a bucket, and, and the water runs in the bucket, and when it gets to a certain point, the bucket can't hold anymore, it's almost full, and just as it gets to the top, it dumps over, and it goes into the next bucket, and then it, the bucket pops back up, and it begins to fill back up again. What a, what a wonderful picture of God blessing His people, pouring Himself out on us, filling us up, blessing us. He doesn't intend for us to hold on to those blessings. He, he does intend for us to thank Him for them and to praise Him and worship Him for those blessings. But He intends for us to pass those blessings on just like that big old water bucket. That we can be filled up and emptied out. Filled up and emptied out. Again and again. And you know, to do that, it doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen on its own. But, but there's some labor involved in that. There's something that has to happen. We have to, we, have to, we have to empty that bucket out and we have to fill it back up. And you know, sometimes, man, have you ever carried, have you ever carried buckets of water or, or carried buckets? Man, that's, that's, and you do it, if you do it all day, man, that's a chore. That's a chore. And you, and you get tired, but... But we are called to be busy, to have a chore, to have a, a work of sharing those blessings. Filling up and pouring out. Filling up and pouring out so that He can bless us over and over and over again. The fourth word that we see from Jesus this morning comes from Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46. And it says... <clears throat> it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This word from the cross points us to the cost of atonement made. Atonement. The price that it cost Christ. What it cost him. You know, that's one of atonement. That's kind of one of those, that's one of those churchy words, right? It means what God had to, uh, what Christ had to pay so that we could have a relationship with God the Father. Thank God there's atonement for sin at the cross. And that atonement for sin at the cross was given by the Lord Jesus Christ. He made that. He paid that. And then the fifth word is from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 19. 
is verse 28. And it simply says, I thirst. This fifth word from the cross serves to tell us that there is suffering in the cross. God's work through His Son Jesus on the cross. It was a hurting work. It was a suffering work. It was a labor of love for us. And then there's the sixth word. And it also comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, in verse 30. He said, it is finished. That word tells us that there is nothing left for man to do but to enter into the results of the Christ's finished work. He did everything that was needed. All the labor, all the work, everything that was needed for us to have that perfect and precious gift of salvation. Christ did it all on the cross. All we have to do is accept that gift. He, he, he's put it out there for us. And he said, here it is, I've done everything. There's nothing for mankind to have to do other than to accept me as Lord and Savior. And then there's the seventh word, and it comes from Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, and verse 46. And here it states, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He laid it upon the altar, just as the burnt offering of the Old Testament, which had been spoken of, of the greatest sacrifice to come. This speaks of Christ's confidence in his Father. You notice he didn't place his spirit in the hands of the world or the people who cried crucify him, or those who stood even weeping at his death on the cross. But he placed it in the confidence of God's hands. He found security in his Father's hands, and in so doing, he points, to, he points the way to all who will die as believers. That's you, and, uh, that's you and me. If you're here this morning, and you're bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's pointing the way for us in death to eternal life with the Father. Yes, there is eternal life and eternal security in the cross. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation of our faith. No matter where I start. No matter where I start, no matter how far I ever go. As a Christian, as a child of God, my journey, my journey, it starts with the cross. It's a, it, it's, it's a foundation, it's a firm foundation pointing straight to heaven. You know, I asked a question when I started. I said, Father, forgive them. Who was them? Who were they, who were they talking about? What group? You know, I understand today that he was talking about me. You see, he knew. He knew that on my own and of myself, there was no way that I could ever get to him. He was talking about me. Father, forgive them. There's forgiveness for you at the cross. Do you know that forgiveness this morning? Do you have that forgiveness in your life? Do you know the forgiveness of the cross? 
And he said, today you will be with me in paradise. That's salvation. That's salvation. That's salvation at the cross. Do you have the peace and the truth of salvation in your life this morning? Do you know what that means? It means that Christ went through the cross. He died for you. And he's given you an a, a invitation to come to him, to be saved. Through Him, by Him, that's salvation for you at the cross. I hope you know that perfect and precious gift of salvation this morning. Then He said, woman, here's your son. There's love for you at the cross this morning. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's atonement. Or you at the cross. Something had to be paid. It's been paid. It's been paid in full. There's nothing left to do but to accept that perfect and precious gift. I thirst. Jesus suffered for you at the cross. You know, for a long time, I wondered about those nails in his hands and his feet. You know, I didn't understand for a long time that those nails in his hands and his feet, maybe there were some ropes. I, I, I don't know all that was there, but, you know, from the, from the portraits and, and all of the history that we know, uh, it, there were ropes, there were nails. I didn't understand for a long time, though, that's not what held Jesus on that cross. What held Jesus on that cross was obedience to his Father and love for you and me. That's what held Jesus on the cross. He said, it is finished. Jesus was the victor over sin for you at the cross. Does it mean we're perfect? No, it doesn't. Does it mean that we're perfect in and through Jesus Christ? Yes, it does. Does it mean we're not going to mess up? No, it doesn't. But what it does mean when we do mess up, we don't fall into that sin over and over again, but we fall into the saving grace, the saving hands of a loving Jesus. Father, into my hands I commit my spirit. There's eternal security for you at the cross. Eternal security. That means that when you give your life to Jesus, when you accept Him into your heart, there's nothing that can take that away. It's a done deal. He's got His seal on you. He's got His mark on you. Nothing can take that away. Not here on this earth, not under this earth, not in all of heaven, not in the deepest ocean, the lowest valley, the highest mountain. There's nothing that can remove you from His grace when you belong to Him. <clears throat> do you belong to Him this morning? I hope that you do. If you don't, I'd love to talk with you about that. I'd love to invite you to come to this altar as we sing our hymn of invitation. And that you would ask Christ to come into your heart. That you would know Him as Lord and Savior. That you would know Him in a way that you've never known Him before. Maybe you've known Him for a long time. You know Him as your Lord and Savior, but you just hadn't been doing all the things that you know you need to do. Or maybe there's an area of your life that you just haven't given over to Him. He wants to have every part of your life, every area, every bit of it. Maybe that's part of that that you need to just come and give to Him this morning. I don't know what your need may be today. 
But I do know that Christ, the Christ of this cross, is more than able. He's more than able to take care of any need or anything that you have in your life today. We celebrate a risen Savior. Amen.